Uh, I'm happy to be here at St. Patrick's Day, but when I leave here, I'm going to party. <laughs> <laughs> I actually am meeting a, a group of friends, and I partied last night, too, in a good way. We had a beautiful night over at the uh, Commodore Barry Irish Club. They had a, an Irish musician, a harpist, who spoke only Gaelic, so that was really neat. And I, myself, was born in Ireland, and have been in this country for many, many years. So I'm more American than Irish, but I'm more Irish than American. If you as lawyers don't think of that, we <laughs> keep, keep the spirit going. And it's wonderful to be with you. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here with you today. And uh, Jackie, yes. we're going to keep us moving. I have a lot to say to you about many things. But the first thing I would like to greet you with is Happy St. Patrick's Day and say peace and all good. That is a Franciscan greeting. I am a sister of St. Francis of Philadelphia. And I bring you peace because that's what our world needs. And you as lawyers bring tremendous peace to our world, to our communities, and you resolve many, many problems. And you can't resolve them all just like myself. I work with corporations and it is very, very challenging as is your job challenging, whether you're a student or have an to we know the difficulties. In fact, I work with lawyers quite a bit because every corporate meeting, there's a lawyer present <laughs> to make sure that nothing is out of line, those chat rules are upheld. And so it's very, very good. And so I'd like to share that piece of all good with you because I think it's a culture. Several years ago, I was working on the issue of violent video games, which is only a minor issue for us. And we worked with Dr. Walsh of All in the Family. And he made a statement that was extremely important to me. And that statement was, he who tells the story defines the culture. And the more and more you think about that sentence today, that is what is happening. We have a culture in our world, in our country. There's a lawyer culture. Who's defining the story for the lawyers? Who's defining the story for the corporate world? Who's defining the story for the Sisters of St. Francis? This is what we hope we'll try to do that. And as Sisters of St. Francis, we have a mission, and we hope that our mission will define our story. And we're going to move you through some of this pretty quickly. This really ties in very meaningfully to the presentation that you just had. And we look at the book of Genesis, and the culture was to say, God saw that it was good. Everything is full of sacred presence. That's a very big difficulty in our culture. This world was given to us by God. We need to recognize that presence. It does not say every person. It says everything. That's a real Franciscan theology. Very, very important. I never speak, if I can, of the poor. Why? It objectifies them. You should always think about it. This is the podium, the book, the paper, the pew. The poor are not objects. You speak of those who are poor. Very big things. And so all of us are made in the image and likeness of God, and Christ is the center. We have to make we are a Christian community. We welcome all the Jewish Muslims. I spent last Sunday at a Muslim mosque for the whole day. So we have to be community, we have to respect one another, and we bring that forth. Okay. Uh, my job is in corporate social responsibility for our communication. This is what I do. And I might be able to break down some of that because an awful lot of material. You can see right off the bat that we monitor our investments from a moral and ethical perspective. What does that mean? I'll tell you right off the bat. We don't have any investments in uh, Newmont mining. Some organizations do. Why? Because they live off the backs of those who are poor and those who have labored in the mines on just uh, tobacco. We have minimal in tobacco so we can talk to that issue. And we're doing fantastic things with $2,000 worth of money from 
Gillespie, Althea, Reynolds. And if you only knew what that meant, we have people in Malawi whose cash crop is tobacco, who pick tobacco all day long, have no access to anything else. They do not have another to be crop, so they live off the pay they get one dollar a day. Those people are being abused. So we have uh, several tobacco companies now who are working with us on human rights issues, on fair labor practices, on education, education, education. That is the key. Okay, and so there are names at this point. If I have shares, if you have shares in a corporation, you have a responsibility to be an active shareholder. And in our country today, there are too many passive shareholders. We put terrible pressure on the VP uh, last year. They wouldn't even speak to American shareholders until a hundred of us from the end of paper which I'll talk to you. And I want to give you examples. Got together and said, we are speaking of the people who live in the Gulf Coast. We're speaking of the 11 men who died. We are speaking for the environment that must live on for thousands of years. And they have done a lot. They haven't gone the distance yet. And so that is part of our mission statement, to be direct our formal resources to the promotion of justice, peace, and reconciliation. That is extremely important for us as Franciscans. Our corporate resources are our investment funds. We have 500 to 600 sisters, many more in retirement facilities. So we need to be able to take care of them and continue to work in all sorts of ministries. Okay. And I think these are keys. When you look at corporate responsibility up there and it says, uh, this is corporate responsibility, this is your world also. You as lawyers, in your operation, wherever it is that you minister, because it's a ministry, you must recognize truth, justice, integrity, and so forth. And you must affirm and respect the dignity that is inherent in each person whether they come from Project Home, St. Francis Inn, or Temple University. And so, when you look at the last question, I want you to think about that for yourself for a moment. You are pursuing a career in law, or you in law, or you are pursuing a career. How many are already lawyers? Oh, great. So, fantastic, that is great. And so, you need to be in touch with your soul. Where is your soul when it comes to truth, justice, and justice? Okay. And that's a big question. Let me tell you, who are the stakeholders in our global society? Anybody? Everyone. Thank you. <laughs> we all are. I'm sure you sort of were thinking that. We are the stakeholders. And you look at the profit. Problems, and you see, who's going to speak for those who are poor? Who's going to speak for those who are homeless? Who's going to speak for those who are being abused? We do a lot of work with women who are trafficked. Actually, not far from here, we have a house for women who are trafficked. The nice house in the religious community. Uh, I recognize, you know, the, our scriptures, the Old Testament, the New Testament, but our Catholic social teachings are the foundation for us of what it is to live justly and to do something about it. And in our Franciscan tradition, we certainly have gotten from St. Francis the care of all creation, being with all those who are oppressed, who are violated in some way, and so you could spend a big year on just the Catholic social teaching. And what I did was look at the building blocks. These are building, building blocks for any human being. You have to look at human dignity, human life, and the word that should always be on your mind, what is best for the common good. You're here today because you're interested in the common good. That is the best. And that's the culture you want to be in. Remember, whoever tells the story, if 
times the function. Okay. I belong to the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility. How many of you are familiar with it? Okay. Uh, briefly, this sort of summarizes it. We are uh, based in New York. We have about 300 members. Our members are not individuals, they are organizations, churches, asset management groups, pension funds, for example, the New York State Pension Fund, the uh, Connecticut Pension Fund, the Methodist Church Pension Fund, billions of dollars. So we can pool our assets, and that is why we can call ourselves the interfaith. We do not work. We have members who are Jewish, who are all different Protestant denominations. A lot of Catholic religious communities work because we were some of the beginning founders, as well as the Presbyterian Church. So it's a fantastic organization. What do we do? What do you do? You seek to build a more just and sustainable society by integrating the social values into corporate and investor decisions. You can apply that to the new Do you do these things? Because many of you may be working in business or corporate planning. Okay. And these are a few other things we do. Because we're faith-based, we do pray. Uh, we have some wonderful opportunities to experience faith together, whether it's Jewish or uh, Protestant or Catholic. I think the big word in there is accountability, because as we move, that's what we're looking for in corporations. And that's what we want. And we want to be credible. I think that's one of the things today that's more important than anything for young lawyers. Are you credible? We have found, uh, I can give you examples later where I think there are some difficulties that uh, I can say it right right now and we weave in with the political problem that we have, where so many are involved in politics so much of our government is politics so much of our operations are political and so many times the political spending to get an act to Congress or through our state makes it very difficult. Lawyers are very important. How do you look at that just okay? And diversity has been extremely important for us as you can see. Who has the resources? And who has the power? Who really has the power today? I'm asking you. White American. Right? White American? Men. Men. Or rich. Or rich. Okay, anybody else? Stakeholders, policy makers, community leaders. Okay, any more? Fortune 500 companies. Yeah. Okay, any others? Do you like to know that we all have the power? We just are a very, very pathetic society at times. When you talk about justice and you're asking about who do we are for you, it's very important to know what we mean by that. We are the stakeholders. We have the power over the resources if we want and if we work hard, that's what we're working on. So that People are in control, not the corporations, not the white, led, big, Fortune 500 co companies. That's why they aren't. We work for a lot of diversity in those companies. Okay, we move on. I'm going to show you this. I think there was a handout that the Ted was going to give you. I had some of this stuff on it. Um, if he has it here at the end. These are the ways. Is it in your folder, maybe? That's an excellent. I, I, that's why you have it, so I can use it. Okay. These are the methods. These are the different methods that we can use to be able to address the corporate world. We have a process, and when you go through this, the processes at times can be uh, very short or it can go on for years. First, we monitor the investment, and that means our Sisters of St. Francis portfolio has a restricted list. We don't 
have any more than $2,000 on any uh, companies like Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Alliant Tech, uh, United Technologies, but we dialogue with all those and they highly respect our work. We just finished a whole session on human rights. Uh, we were the ones who got nuclear weapons out of GE. We actually had Jack Welch land at our mother house property about 20 years ago when we were basically fighting with him to stop building nuclear weapons. We still have that as a major problem today. But I might get into it. We work with the corporations on doing things that will bring peace rather than always bring the war. Very difficult situation. We don't buy percent tobacco. Any, um, we don't have any money in any companies that would be making abort efficient drugs. We do not have any money in any corporation that we are aware of that would be promoting, uh, what do I call it? It's violence in the media, but it's even more than violence. We certainly wouldn't be supporting companies that make restricted movies, pornography. Uh, if we know a company is involved in trafficking and we can work with them, we will. That's the hotel industry, the travel industry, etc. Uh, that's restricted list pretty much tobacco, gambling, of course, we don't have any money in gambling. Uh, the other area is we look at human rights. That's a very important area for all of us to work in, and I'll talk a little more about that in the secret now. We file a shareholder resolution. A shareholder resolution, often called a proposal, is the most powerful tool. If anybody in this room, for example, right now, has any shares in Chevron, we have a big resolution with Chevron, I'll talk a little bit maybe a time later, about it because we got 40% of the shareholder vote last year, and we may get more this year. So, you see a little folder that says Chevron, or if your friends oh, look for the Chevron filing, that'll be coming up in a couple of weeks. It's time voting proxies. If you have shares, you should vote your proxies. You say, I don't know what that means. That's what people say all the time. It just means look and see who's on the board. Look at the compensation committee and see why the executive is getting $36 million and another 20 in stock options. Now you look. We are not an active shareholder society, and that's why corporations uh, get away with it. And we make recommendation, recommendations for divestment. There's a lot, uh, we divested of News Corp. We had some shares in News Corp. You know what happened in News Corp. I'm sure you read about that. Uh, we uh, are, a lot of people are thinking about divesting from, we never invested in Halliburton. We would not be doing make progress, and you know the whole story of Albert. So we have specific companies, so we, we call for a divestment if we feel that we don't get any place with dialogue. And the Presbyterian Church right now is wrestling with several companies that have Israeli investments because of the Israeli-Palestinian issues, quite serious. Um, Community development is the most exciting part of my work. We as a, a community had hospitals, and we were corporately responsible when our hospitals were, were bought out by a system. They gave us a large sum of money to put into a mission fund. So that money, we decided as part of our general investment, every year we would spend at least $100,000 investing in local communities. Here in Philadelphia, if you've ever heard, you must have heard of TRF, the Reinvestment Fund. We helped to start that fund 25, 30 years ago with a small investment of $25,000. So we have investments all over the globe from that fund because every year we reinvest. Uh, in fact, if I had time today, I would have my email yesterday. I got a great email uh, from the Global Development Network, where we have an investment where they have made tremendous progress with a, a group of people in South America. So it's one of those things. 
And the same is true for social justice grants. Somebody this morning already asked me about a social justice grant. And one of the representatives here has one of our social justice grants. Small organizations who need a couple of thousand dollars to get a little project off the ground. So we do those kinds of things. Okay, moving on. These are the areas, I think you saw them already, pretty much about peace. I'm going to go over some of them, particularly if you need to take a quick look. All of them are so very important. You can spend an hour on each one, so I, I can't spend that time on the next one. I've read that picture before you, because I'm sure many of you have seen that picture before. That picture is in, uh, outside one of the big um, government buildings in, I think, Lucerne. It's a chair. It's a broken chair. And I find it very important for us to look at that chair and think about where we are. Our society, we will often say, is broken. But the nice thing about the chair is most of the chair is there, and we can fix it. So our goal is to look at our society and see what we can do to fix it. And that's just as simple for you to see where you are as a lawyer and what you can do. Uh, I'll come back to this picture, but this just gives you a very small idea of the corporate work that we do have done. Every corporation that is on that chart has been in our portfolio, is in our portfolio, and we have worked with them on some issue. And usually, if I work with uh, some of the students, they always get excited about their corporation and they want to know why would we be doing anything with them. Because they look at it negatively, but it's not all negative. It's negative and positive. And I might come back to that, but I think that I'll keep going until I know what time we have. This is the issue that I think is of major interest. It must be of a major interest to all of us. Are you familiar with this issue? Pretty familiar? OK. You know what the Marcellus How many don't know what the Marcellus Shale is? Be honest. OK. The Marcellus Shale actually is a geographic, geological area of Europe and specifically at the United States right now, it's all over the world. It's a type of rock. It's a shale under which eight to nine thousand feet, or six, six to nine generally, you will find natural gas. And I know you've heard the word fracking. If you can't live in this society, you have to hear about fracking. Okay, so you see Pennsylvania coming up from West Virginia all the way up into the Pocono Mountains, southern New York. That area is called Marcellus. There's a small town in New York named Marcellus, and they found that shale there, and they named the whole region. He goes back as a whole other geological kind of workshop to go back to the Devonian age, when you see all the, uh, over the millions of years, the soil, the rock, the leaves, whatever, is embedded, and over 100 years it forms coal, gas, whatever. So when you look at the Marcellus shale, we are in the thick of it in Pennsylvania. And I have a serious problem with it, and a lot of people do, and a lot of people have no problem with it. So it's one of the major issues that I'm working on, and it's one of the major issues that Pennsylvania citizens need to be aware of. First of all, that article that is up there is extremely important. That's in our Constitution. Would you read it for me together, please? See if you're awake. The people <laughs>
website on uh, environmental protection. That is only a pinhead of what has been happening for the past, since 2002. So you're talking 10 years. Just in January to August of last year, take a look at Tioga, which is up in the northern part of the state. Can you see that pretty well? You had 277 permits issued by the state to build wells. And they have actually had also finished 150 wells. OK? So when you look at the whole map of Pennsylvania, you see the permits were almost 4,000. The well wells drilled were almost 2,000. That's a lot of wells in six months. Multiply that by each six months, and you're talking thousands. By the year 2025, we we'll have thousands of wells and pipes and everything else that I'll tell you more about. Look at um, Western Pennsylvania. Look at Washington County and Green County on the southwest. I have visited the people of those two areas several times. They have been seriously impacted by the drilling process. How did it happen? It happened in several ways. We need natural gas, obviously. There are millions of cubic feet of natural gas under Pennsylvania in many areas. We don't seem to have too much in this area, but I'm sure that by something eventually. In those areas that you see in the western part, most of those people in Washington, Green Bay, and those counties all the way up through Pittsburgh are already victims of the coal industry. So they're basically economically poor. Little communities, not much access to jobs unless they go into the city of Pittsburgh. I have visited those communities. I went because I wanted to know what was really happening. Obviously, in about 2004, landmen, as they're called, would come to the U.S. and they'd say, Wes, you have a, a house here and you don't seem to have much of an income. Maybe you have a few cattle, maybe you have a little farm. We have discovered that this area has lots of natural gas. And if you lease, not buy, if you lease your mineral rights to me, I'm the landman, then you're going to get royalties each month. You will, that will go on for a year, so you'll become rich. So here's the paper. Would you like to sign it? You're in good shape. What would a person who is poor do? Sign. And Glenn back there is a member of the Pennsylvania Farm Association. So he's pretty big shot when it comes to the farmers, because a lot of beautiful farmland. He hears about it, and Glenn says, I think it's a really good idea, so I'm going to check it out. And I have a beautiful farm, I have two huge ponds, they're really interested in my land because of the ponds. So guess what? I'm going to get $2 million for leasing my land, which is, I think it's only about a 14-acre farm. But the water was important. I was going to tell you a little more about that. So what happens then? You lease $2 million. You're getting royalties each month. The base lease. Who wouldn't say yes? Nobody told you what was going to happen. So Glenn goes to Alan, or I think it's Rachel, your neighbors, and somebody else can see the names. Pete, Glenn goes to the people in the association. Hey, we need to lease our land. This is going to be great. So the farmers went around and encouraged the leasing. And the government said, it's, it's, it's great. So we had all these natural gas, oil and gas companies come in, start drilling, and get working, and the people are bought. What's the problem here? 
before I even go further as a lawyer, should tell me what's the problem. Thank you. Free, pre, pre, prior, informed consent. Some people think that's only for indigenous people. Pre, prior, and informed, and free. So, not educated, the little government of Pennsylvania said, oh, we're going to get on the ball because the government's getting money too, they're getting taxes, all of this. What has happened? Then we get a new governor who has gotten tremendous benefit from the industry. So his pockets are lined, so it can only look good. But I want to go through you, we'll, we'll go on and so that you can learn. This is a typical uh, area for the wells. The picture isn't as clear here as you like. But if you look uh, to the right hand side here, you see three big ponds. They are ponds of water. They are actually ponds of wastewater. To drill a well, and that would take me an hour to teach you, but quickly, drill a well actually takes at, at least one million gallons of water. Mixed with toxic chemicals, which we still don't know what they are, and sand. And they actually go down the drill, drill the well, and blast down 5,000, 6,000 feet. And if the sand helps to remain with the cracks, it releases the gas, and the gas comes back up with the wastewater. The wastewater has to be stored. So temporarily, different companies are doing different things. They store it in what are known as practicates. The wastewater is contaminated very definitely. It cannot even go to a wastewater treatment plant in our state. The, the government has finally said no, because the Monongahela wastewater treatment plant was getting some of this stuff, and it couldn't treat it. That's how serious it is. So what you see all around there are well, well is being dug, big water coming out of the ground. You see trucks of chemicals, trucks of water, and you see a road that has been built into the woods, and you see a little home over there. That little home is in great, great danger, because if they have a lot of people who live in the country in Pennsylvania don't have city water, they have their own wells, and sometimes their wells are not as deep as they should be. So if any gas or methane escape, it goes right into their drinking water. So it's quite serious. This is a major, major issue you need to know about. Uh, we'll go on here. These are the reasons why there are serious problems. Number one, we have worked personally for four years with Chesapeake Energy, Chevron, Range Resources, ExxonMobil, and Adarco. And then there are several others. We have shares in those five companies. And we have been working diligently with them to get key performance indicators in. Number one, build the well forever. When you build a well, I, I spent a day from an engineer learning how to build a well, so I know what I was talking about. You have to have well casing, several layers of thick pipes, and cement properly. The problem is sometimes the subcontractors cut, cut their costs and use cheap cement. What's going to happen 20 years from now in these wells? It's going to affect us if we don't fight it. So the other thing, you might not think it right now because you're not directly involved. But this is what we call distributive justice, environmental justice. We are being affected, and we will be eventually, if the water in the state is contaminated. And I think a big part of it for me is to go back to our human rights statement in our Constitution. Our Constitution has been violated, and the lawyers in our state have not protected it. That is not in, an indictment on lawyers because many I have worked with who are very upset that this has happened, but the power resides in the state government, which at this point in time is allowing the gas industry to have a party. 
they have begun to get more serious regulations. And the company, excuse, we spoke to Exxon Mobil two, two weeks ago. And they said, we're making on state regulations. Hmm. Our hands are tied if the state regulations aren't enforced. Chesapeake has had the gas spew into the air up in central Pennsylvania, Bradford County. Nobody knew how to stop it. It was like the uh, Gulf on a smaller scale. It took 15 hours to bring an engineer in from Texas. Hmm. That is what happened. So be aware, folks, what is happening around us. Community rights are violated. Free, prior, informed consent. We are saying to the companies, and a couple of them have said, we'll bring you what we to set up in the rights. They need to meet with every one of you so that you can ask questions about your health, your serious health problems. That's a human right. When I visited families in uh, Cross Creek, Washington County, in Pennsylvania, I both was scared and sad, angry and upset. A couple of the families were uh, Native American, African, uh, dealing with poverty and illness already. Little communities, the long stories, I can't make it long, they could not drink the water and the first sign that they saw was their dog wouldn't drink the water. Then when uh, the one woman came that her dad who was late 80s dying because of being exposed to the air and the water, he actually, his body indicated that it was chemical contamination. No doctors in the local area would test because the doctors were afraid. And that's happening too. When I spoke to a doctor at the University of Pennsylvania, I said, why is, would that be a problem? And she said, well, it is a problem because many hospitals in Pittsburgh are built by the gas industry. We have serious problems, folks. And the state is dealing with some of it, but not all of it, and people are seriously affected. When we went from Pittsburgh down to this little community, there were a couple of us, and we had a couple of cars, and they said, we'll fill the cars with water. We actually took water bottles, two gallon water bottles. They didn't take them to the people, put them by the mailbox. That's what some of the people do almost every week. And the last time I was there in October, I was told that a couple of the children have had very bad nosebleeds, which are unusual. Some have what they call frack rash, because if they're using the water to take a shower, it's hurting their skin. There's tulene, benzene, methane, of course. There are all these chemicals that are in, and lots more. And one of the things that we are asking for is disclosure. And we're getting a certain amount. If you go on the website, you could find a, a website that says Frack Focus, and all the companies are supposed to put in there what's in their uh, mixture. They don't tell you. They tell you it's the stuff that's under your sink. So there's got to be a lot more if they can't disclose it, and it's proprietary information. And they're, we're working on it. The state is working. As shareholders, we're pushing the industry to do it. We have resolutions. We get a little bit of progress each time, but we need the public to keep working on it, too. We, I don't know if in uh, September, I guess, we had a huge rally here in Philly to make sure there's no uh, drilling in the Delaware River Basin. And there were at least 3,000 people at the rally. And we did stop for now. There is a moratorium. But if drilling happens in the Delaware River Basin, it could affect all our water and water of New York City. So that's the fight that's still going on. Most of New York still has a moratorium. Uh, radioactive elements is pretty serious because they say there's a lot of carcinogens in some of the chippings that will come up with the wastewater. And in southern New York, right at the top of the Pennsylvania border, they were known to take the sludge that's in that frack water because it's full of brine and use it to uh, spread on the road to defrost or de-ice the roads. Can you imagine children playing? those streets where that has happened. That's what's happening. I'm not imagining. The water you 
focus is quite serious because that's a world issue, the most serious issue for us as shareholders. With every corporation, we're doing something on how they are using water, what they're doing about recycling, what they're doing about all the metrics that they need to use to protect water. It's the same water we're going to get back over and over again. And if you look at the issue, the frack water uh, cannot go through water treatment plants, so they are not doing some things. They're storing it in steel containers. Some of it was sent out to Ohio to put into pits because the soil in Pennsylvania wouldn't be appropriate. Now they're telling us they're having little earthquakes in Youngstown because of this frack water. So Ohioans now are upset. So you need to read about it. The other piece is when you look at the disposal of the wastewater, that's only one of the issues. One of the days that I was there, we were taken to see a compression station. I had no idea what a compression station is. But the compression station we went to was at least three times as big as this church. Massive fans. There were six massive fans. It was extremely noisy. And a group of people came from maybe, well, I'd say two blocks away, but it was country. And the one woman said, we can never sleep. The noise is so bad. And then you might go to sleep, and then you hear this hissing sound, and then you get this little explosion of gas being released. And I, I felt it, and I had an autoimmune problem, so I said, I'm running, I'm going to get out of here, but I was so scared. I, I went and got in the car because you could actually hear the release of gas. That is methane. I have even spoken to the fact that when all these gases are released, they tell us, some people tell us, that it will make it worse for climate change because there's more natural gas being used, it's being released into the air, and much more than it is in coal. So that's a huge debate that's taking place right now. We want coal plants closed, and here we have this problem with natural gas. Will it be less polluting than the coal plants? I mean, it, I mean, we're not sure because we're not getting the information. Scientific studies need to be completed on that. And then we have the problem of contractor oversight. Families who live in little communities have problems with truck noise. It takes 50 to 1,000 loads of water and sand and, and trucks to bring in the stuff. Now they, have, they put in a well that's only one piece. Where's the gas going to go? So you need distributing lines, you need gathering lines. So pipelines are being put in every place. And the pipelines that are being put in are going to come to the city, they're going to come our way in order to export some of this gas overseas. When they go to the compression station and they compress the gas into different types of gas, uh, ethylene is very useful in making plastics and different products. A lot of that is going to be shipped right out of the country for export. And so contractors are cutting corners, not doing enough to stay with the program. We're getting a signal. So you see what I mean? We'll go on a little bit. How many minutes, sir? Um, we're done. Uh, very few. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just uh, a few minutes ago. About five. Uh, I'll move on. It's really important for you, uh, even to continue to think of human rights. And the beautiful thing about this is John Ruggie from Harvard has spent about five years being commissioned to do something about human rights with corporations and for corporations. And this framework is being really put into effect. And it is so simple. Corporations should protect, respect, and if there's a problem, remedy. And so should governments, OK? Um, I guess that's good. This is DMOC. And one of the things they did is sign up. They had no drinking water for three years. And it's still a fight that's going on. The EPA actually bought drinking water after the Cabinet Energy did not 